You know, one of the most early and vivid IndyCar memories I have is of the 1997 Portland race. It was a mixed condition, wild race with an incredible finish of three cars abreast across the line. Mark Blundell taking the win over Jill DeFerrin and Raul Boisel. And I have to say, a race like that leaves an impression on a young person to the point where they become a fan for life. Instant classics, if you will. And the return of IndyCar to Portland, I have to describe as just that, an instant classic. So let's talk about it. So a great grid of 25 cars funneled down into the festival curves. And I was glad NBC pointed out the history of the festival curves could be because there was a history of pileups. And it looked like Alfonso Solis Jr. was going to be the driver who was going to cause the pileup. A big lockup in the back, several drivers scattering to avoid him. But it turned out the actual pileup happened further up the track as Zach Veach and James Hinchcliffe got involved and then collected several other cars, including Marco Andretti, who went upside down over the top of Ed Jones, clipping the tops of Graham Rahal and James Hinchcliffe, and rolling over a huge dust cloud. And in the middle of the dust cloud, it turned out, was Scott Dixon. But like a Terminator, like a freaking Terminator, Dixon removed himself from the crash unscathed he kept the car going the car didn't even need a front wing despite having a pretty massive tire mark on the nose cone of the car an absolutely incredible uh, start to the race and uh, it was great to see Marco Andretti be able to get out of the car uh, under his own power the AMR safety crew was absolutely on it I think somebody timed it on Twitter at 10 seconds between the time his car came to a rest and the time the safety crew was there. Uh, take that, Felipe Massa. Another thing to talk about is the fact that this onboard shot uh, with James Hinchcliffe, man, oh man, for the second week out of three, we've had an incredibly scary onboard from James Hinchcliffe. Uh, but again, I have to look at uh, you, Felipe Massa. Uh, this is about as similar a crash as you could get to what happened at Spa, and all of the drivers were able to get uh, out of their cars just fine. Just, a, again, a spectacular, spectacular crash uh, to start this one. This is a, a, the kind of thing we haven't seen in quite a while in terms of a road course pileup, especially one getting upside down. Ironically enough, it's Marco again. Uh, that was something that uh, he had a problem with both at Mid-Ohio in 2007 and St. Petersburg 2011. He's just not very uh, lucky on the starts of these road course races. Seems like he always ends up on his head uh, when crashes like this happen. Jones was out of the race. Ray Hall was out of the race. Uh, it was interesting because uh, James Hinchcliffe actually got back into the race. They repaired the roll bar uh, over the top of his head, though it was Sands, the onboard camera, because Marco took it off of him. And of course, Scott Dixon got back into the race. So then we get to the restart, and it looks like it's going to be a willpower versus Alexander Rossi battle. And, of course, these are two of the championship contenders that were going to benefit a whole lot from Dixon having early troubles, though they would have benefited a lot more if Dixon had been taken out. But then, suddenly, willpower in trouble. The car slows down. It looks like something has completely uh, failed terminally, though he gets back going. It turns out it was a gearbox issue and an issue that would plague him for the remainder of the race. So it looks like Alexander Rossi is having the championship absolutely fall into his lap. This was going about as well for Alexander Rossi as it possibly could. And as we've seen on the rest of the road course races this year, Rossi was absolutely on fire. He was pulling away so far from the rest of the field. He had something like a four-second lead on Ryan hunter Ray at one point and then the first round of pit stops happened and he continued to stretch that lead he decided to switch to the black alternate tires i guess i'm going to call the black tires the alternate tires this weekend because nobody wanted to be on the black tires because there was such a huge delta between the blacks and the reds but again that's kind of what you want when you have an alternate tire so i'm not going to complain too much about that but one of the or there was a couple important things to take away from the first round of pit stops and number one was the fact that Scott Dixon's troubles really continued to pile up on him uh, meaning he came into the pits for his first pit stop he'd actually gotten back up into the top 10 and he was hit with a speeding penalty 
possibly because there was some damage done to the electronics of the car. Uh, Dixon seemed to be unclear as to exactly why he received the penalty. Ultimately, the result is the same. He was speeding in the pits and received a penalty for this. But a bit more significantly, and something a lot of people, including NBC, at least originally, didn't pick up upon, but uh, Takuma Sato was doing the exact same thing that he did at the Gateway Race, or I guess the same thing that the Ray Hall team as a whole did at the Gateway Race, and was stretching the fuel an absolutely incredible uh, incredibly long time. I can't even imagine how much fuel saving uh, uh, Sato was doing. I believe he started somewhere in 19th place, but through the pit cycle, at least when he was on his fuel strategy and had and, and yet to make a stop, he was second on the track to Alexander Rossi. And it was interesting, just, I, it was something that passed through my mind at that point pretty quickly because I was like, okay, Sato's saving a lot of fuel, maybe he'll factor into the end of the race. Boy, did he factor into the end of the race, but we'll get to that. Will Powers' can, troubles just absolutely continued. Uh, a, a shambles of a race, and unfortunately, more or less, I know he's still in the points contention uh, because of the double points factor, uh, but this crash pretty much took him out of the points contendership. Uh, just uh, kind of that chicane on the back straightaway had been a bugaboo corner for a lot of people throughout the weekend, and Will Power was just the most recent driver to be caught out by it. Uh, and then his gearbox troubles really uh, stacked up on him, and I think he lost something like six or seven laps. On the restart, though, Significantly, suddenly, here's Joseph Newgarden, a pass on Alexander Rossi. Now, this was a lot of uh, a lot to do with the fact that there was a huge difference in delta time between the red and the black tires. We also saw Jordan King moving up through the field. It looked like the battle for the win was going to be between Newgarden, Rossi, and King. Not so fast. Another crash in the backstretch chicane. This time, it was Zach Veach, who had actually, up until this point, had a really good race going, despite the contact, the early contact, with James Hinchcliffe. And I guess at this point, uh, even though we're talking about a separate Zach Veach accident at this point, I guess it's worth mentioning that Veach was blamed pretty heavily by the other drivers, most notably Graham Rahal, for the first corner accident where uh, he it definitely looked like he pinched Hinchcliffe. Uh, you got mirrors and you got spotters. I, I would put that probably 75% Veach, 25% Hinch. So yeah, Veach's fault, but probably not 100% like hey, Ray Hall was willing to point out. But I will say one thing about Ray Hall's rant on race control. I think he's absolutely right, and I've been saying it for quite a while, that I think race control this season on the road courses has been a bit too lenient on contact in terms of side-to-side uh, -side, uh, impacts. Of course, we go all the way back to St. Petersburg when Rossi mugged uh, Wickens for the win. Well, it didn't turn out it was for the win. It was given the win to Bordet. But regardless, just things like that, I think, deserve an avoidable contact penalty, and they haven't been getting them. I was glad to see Ray Hall call that out. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it was definitely, uh, probably didn't go over very well with IndyCar management. So, the yellow for Veach, what we were talking about. The interesting thing about this was we had a lot of the leaders not necessarily really good on fuel one way or the other. It was interesting. We kind of saw a split in the field. We saw guys like Newgard, Rossi, and King, the leaders at that point, all come into the pits and make stops. That gave the front of the field to guys like Ryan hunter Ray, to Kuma Sato. Uh, and this is where things were really getting interesting because it's like, okay, what the heck is going on here? Scott Dixon's up at the front. Sebastian Bourdais up at the front. Bourdais was involved in the opening lap crash as well. And we've got all these guys up at the front that just mind-blowing, mind-boggling that they are up there. And suddenly, the race is completely turned on its head, and so is the championship. Because not only is Rossi going for the championship, but Newgarden was in a must-win situation himself. He's one of the four drivers still mathematically eligible. So all these drivers are now at the back as the green flag comes back out. And we definitely saw some crazy moves, particularly uh, from Newgarden, but also Rossi really trying to get back up through the field. Poor Alfonso Solis Jr. was bullied quite a bit on that restart. 
And then it's the question of, well, who can make it on fuel? What is going to happen here? It seemed like everybody needed one more, or it was kind of confirmed that everyone needed one more stop. It was just going to be a matter of whether the guys like Hunter Ray, Sato, and the like could save fuel enough to just stay ahead of the guys like Newgarden and Rossi, who maybe were on a slightly less fuel management uh, schedule and could just go all out. But that all changed when... <laughs> Santino Ferrucci, or as Paul Tracy called him, Santucci uh, ran out of fuel. Apparently, that's what the uh, what the seemed to be the consensus of what happened was uh, to Santucci Ferrucci. Uh, but yes, the yellow flag did fly, but it did fly after race control allowed all the cars to pit under the green flag. Now, generally speaking, I'm not a fan of this. I think it's a bit of a race manipulation to do something. If you're going to call a full, full course yellow, that means generally speaking, there's a reason that you're going to call a full course yellow. There's a dangerous situation that you don't want cars running at full racing speed. And, you know, again, you don't want somebody to, for some reason, spear off at full racing speed and hit uh, Santucci when he's sitting there uh, pretty much helpless. Regardless, it gave everybody an equal shot to get in the pits under the green flag, didn't disadvantage anyone. And it turns out that the running order that we had was pretty much the running order that we were going to have battling for the win, except for Max Chilton. Somehow Max Chilton got into the lead. Uh, it was a huge botch on their on the Carlin Racing strategy, unfortunately for him, because he'd been running in the top 10 most of the day. Uh, but he was the leader on the restart, but very quickly uh, he dropped off. Now what's interesting about the pit stops under the green flag were that Ryan Hunter Ray came in much earlier than Takuma Sato did. So Sato actually was able to leapfrog Hunter Ray uh, before the yellow. So Hunter Ray, or, uh, Hunter Ray was now third, and Sato was now second, and Sato was now the driver in the catbird seat. This is one thing I do kind of critique uh, NBC on. Uh, I wish when there's situations like that where you've got drivers who are very clearly going to be in the hunt for the, the finish, uh, keep track of the gaps when they're coming in and out of the pits, or at least have a camera on them to be able to see, because we never saw Sato come by uh, Hunter Ray. We only found out about that after the caution flag had come out. So I would like to see a little bit better job of, of paying attention to the cars that are technically the leaders and seeing where and when they come out of the pits. Regardless, as soon as Chilton pulled off into the pits, it was looked like it was Sato's race to win because Sato was able to just maintain a nice gap over Hunter Ray because of the fact that Hunter Ray pitted a bit earlier, he had to be a little bit more conservative with fuel. So a lot of the gap we saw, it seemed like the cars were a lot more even than kind of we were talking about or kind of it led on. Because again, Hunter Ray was saving a bit of fuel. It, it was still like something like a 30, 30 lap stint at the end of the race that went the distance green flag. And that's about what the fuel numbers were for this race. So. Uh, there was a bit of fuel saving from all of the competitors, but once it got to the end of the race, it was go time, and Ryan Hunter Ray started burning up his push to pass, started, started really taking a charge at Takuma Sato, and it was great to see Takuma Sato be able to hold off Ryan Hunter Ray. It was kind of the opposite of the uh, Italian Grand Prix earlier in the morning, where uh, I think most of the people were cheering for Kimmy. I know there's some Kimmy haters out there, but I think most of the people wanted to see a Kimmy victory and then uh, Hamilton passed him and, and it was uh, you know kind of the predictive result. Well, Hunter Ray's had a win earlier this year and Hunter Ray usually runs up at the front. Takuma Sato doesn't run up at the front quite as much, so I think it was kind of the same similar situation where most people were kind of, even though everybody likes seems to like Hunter Ray more or less, uh, most people were kind of cheering for Sato in this situation and uh, it was cool to see Takuma Sato hold off Ryan Hunter Ray uh, in a pretty dramatic finish, all things considered. It, it never got to a pass attempt, but it was close enough that it was very exciting. And Sato takes his third win of his career uh, and his first since his Indianapolis 500 triumph in 2017. What a feel-good story. What a feel-good story. And, and by the way, rounding out the podium uh, was Sebastian Bourdais. Uh, wh how crazy was that? And that was the other thing. I was kind of thinking in the back of my mind, we could have a St. Pete situation here where we have the two leaders take each other out and Bourdais ends up uh, benefiting from that. But yeah, 
Sato, it's always nice to see him get a victory because Taku is such a, a likable personality, such a gentleman, uh, both on and off the track. It's just fantastic to see him get a win. It's cool to see Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan get a victory. They haven't had one since, I think, 2016 Texas. So uh, it's been quite a while since they've been in victory lane, and it certainly hasn't been for a lot. La- oh, no, that's wrong. It was... Uh, Last year at Detroit with uh, Graham Rahal. See, uh, the, the, the brain rattles around a little bit. So, yeah, it's been a year since they've got a victory. And, but, again, it doesn't make it any less cool to see that team get into victory lane. Uh, what a competitive race as well. Just what a fantastic job by the IndyCar competitors. Even Alfonso Solis. I know a lot of people were like, oh, get him out of the theories. He sucks. You know, he, he, he kept on the pace. Uh, there were a couple mistakes from him. Uh, he's definitely got bullied a bit. But he stayed in the race and finished it. So pretty much all 25 competitors really did a good job, even though some of them didn't make it out of the first corner, uh, to put on a great show. Uh, And it was a great show. Again, I think this race is one we're going to look at down the line and say that was an instant classic. That's one we're gonna we're gonna put in the kind of the the ninety five Clevelands of the world and the and the ninety seven Portlands of the world as some of the great road course races that have ever been run uh, in IndyCar history. And Scott Dixon, top five finish. (laughs) Alexander Rossi was mired just a couple of positions behind him. I think he was in eighth position by the end of the race. And just a quick shout out to Charlie Kimball and Simon Pagino. Both of those drivers had terrible weekends, got top 10 finishes. How crazy was this race? I am just blown away by how great this race was. I, I can't say it enough. And I'm kind of disappointed that we go to Sonoma next. Then again, Seeing how the road course racing product has been this year for IndyCar, maybe fingers crossed that the final Sonoma race is going to be absolutely a barn burner championship. What do we think? Well, when I was thinking kind of a couple weeks ago, I think prior to Pocono, I was kind of like, okay, what are the races that are Dixon races and what are the races that are Rossi races? Well, I looked at Portland as a Rossi race. Turned out Dixon got the advantage. 29 points is the difference. Now, double points obviously are going to mean that we're going to have some stupid crap be going on. And it also means that we've got guys like Power and Newgarden that are still theoretically and mathematically eligible for the championship. But ultimately, it's going to come down to Dixon and Rossi. So which driver, It really it's going to come down to which driver finishes ahead of the other driver on track. Now, Rossi's going to need a little bit more of a buffer between him and Dixon, but it's not going to be a whole lot. If he, I think it's going to be something like four or five positions he needs to finish ahead of Dixon. Uh, there's definitely some bonus points on the line. I think there's a point for uh, scoring the pole position. I think there's another bonus point for scoring uh, or leading the most laps of the race. So those are going to be the objectives. We look at prior history at Sonoma. I think it's a Dixon track. We look at prior history in terms of the recent past of who have been the dominant drivers on the road courses. You look at Alexander Rossi. It's going to be all determinant on which team, Andretti Autosport or Ganassi, has the right setup for Sonoma. We've got Universal Aero Kits this year, so I don't know how that's going to affect the Penske guys. There's a potential that the Penske guys are going to do what they did this weekend at Portland and sweep the front row. Of course, the two championship contenders, I mean, Power and Newgarden. So they could be the spoilers in this thing, and not necessarily from the perspective that they are the championship contenders, but the fact that we've kind of seen Penske really be, be the best team at Sonoma in the, year, in the most recent years prior. So I think it's going to be Dixon. I think Dixon's going to take his fifth IndyCar championship. I'd like to see Rossi. I think Rossi would be a a fun champion to have. I think the second young American driver to take a championship in a row would be spectacular. Uh, But we look at that lockup, the break lockup at Detroit from Alexander Rossi, where he gave away uh, a pretty solid second place finish uh, to not even finish in the top 10. And that point swing we're looking at now, 29 points, it would at least be close to even if he had taken second place at Detroit that day. So, this is an uphill battle for Rossi. And if he pulls it off, he will definitely earn the championship, double points notwithstanding. So, we'll see you in two weeks for Sonoma. Let me know your comments on this race. 
down in the comments below. Let me know uh, what you think the championship is going to hold. What's going to happen? This is exciting times to be an IndyCar fan, and it's going to be a pretty dramatic, I think, finish to the season in Sonoma. Can't wait to see you there. Thank you guys so much for watching. This has been David Land on YouTube, and we'll see you in the next video.